Um, let's see. First crack. We've been working with Joe in building segments of a roast. We've been talking apart about uh, charge temperature. We've been talking about charge size. We've been talking about turnaround. We've been talking about the drying phase of coffee. And Joe is going to talk about first crack. So, Joe, this forum is yours, my friend. Well, thank you. Um, so, as you can see here on the board, there's a lot of stuff to get through. It can be very, very complicated. I am not going to complicate this, um, but rather I'm much. hoping to simplify this <laughs> as much as I possibly can. And we're going to we're going to start kind of simple, then we're going to get very complicated, and then we're going to come back down to hopefully being very simple again. So hang with me. And know that if you don't have the time to sit down and watch through an entire episode, it's cool. There's this wonderful feature on the internet called pause. So you can watch a little bit, pause it, go back, go do your work, come back at another time, mark where you stopped. Uh, we want you to take your time and digest these things. Also, understand I am not a scientist, so a lot of the things that I'm talking about here are things that I've learned in a similar way to how I'm teaching them. So if you are a scientist and you know some of this stuff more in depth or better than I do or a way to explain it that I am not explaining it, please reach out and let me know because I would love to bring that to the forefront. I am not the end-all, be-all authority on all things coffee, so you are I want to learn me. as well. Oh, I thank you. There we go. <laughs> and ask your questions away. Nick grabs these questions uh, as Joe presents. And then Nick will feed them in as Nick sees an appropriate time and place in Joe's lecture. Yeah, if I'm just teaching based on what I think you want to know, we're going to have a disconnect. I want to teach based on what you do want to know and what you are needing to know. Okay? All right. So I have the title here called Browning, First Crack, Development. These are all terms that we use within coffee kind of in a general way. The way that First Crack has been... Um, adopted into our lexicon has been almost like this moment where it's like a magical moment and then everything that happens prior to first crack is just building heat everything that's happening f uh, post first crack is something called development where we're where we are building flavor and I have to say that that is a myth and I want to talk to you about why that's a myth what's happening when and what importance first crack actually has to us and uh, this term development what does that actually mean okay so we have those two stages of roasting the first stage from the time that we have the charge to the time that our coffee is yellow once again is something called endothermic it's an endothermic reaction where we're absorbing heat and remember this is actually a myth as well we're actually moving ever forward with momentum. That's why I have the dotted line here, okay? So coffee starts at the room temperature from which you got your bag of coffee and put it in, and then it's ever moving forward at a curve, okay? So as this coffee is moving forward, it absorbs heat, all of your free moisture leaves the coffee, and at that point when you start seeing some browning reactions, that is where you are beginning what I would call development. You are now changing chemical compounds in the coffee into flavors. So there are a bunch of different chemical compounds that are within the coffee. ATP is a, a um, type of energy that is stored in the coffee. And that ATP is broken down by the coffee plant in order to energize that plant. Within a seed, it's stored in a way that that seed, when activated with water and in the ground, will begin breaking it down, okay? The plant uses a system called hydrolysis. Hydrolysis is where water is kind of injected and, and um, pushed into the molecule, and it cleaves that molecule into different molecules. So if you have a large molecule of cellulose, for instance, you can use the process of hydrolysis to create something called cellulose. This process is, or this uh, compound, 
through which hydrolysis happens is called solubase, and then you can break it down to glucose. And of course, glucose we know is a sugar. Okay, this is not what is happening within roasting. I hear a lot of times people talking about, about hydrolysis in roasting. That's actually not happening. That's not the chemical reaction that we want to focus on. This is what happens in beer, though. If you have that, that grain, you allow the grain to germinate, and the hydrolysis process breaks down those starches into more simple sugars, which are then soluble, and which, of course, bacteria like to eat, and they burp out their gases, and they make alcohol. Um, however, we're going to look at different reactions that are taking place. Now, there are some people who have projected that early in the roast, prior to yellowing, there is some hydrolysis happening because we're adding energy to the seed and that seed has water in it. Hydrolysis has to happen with water present. Once we've dried that coffee out though, the water that is present is being manufactured by these processes of dehydration, which are dehydrating molecules. We're breaking those molecules down, okay? So let's focus mainly on these reactions, okay? The Maillard reaction starts taking place when we move out of yellow and we start seeing browning and we start smelling aromatics that are telling us that that reaction is happening. That is this list of things that I have here, okay? Ketones, furans, aldehydes, esters, phenolics, terpenoids, thiols, all of the, and there are more. These are all actually categories of different types of aromatic compounds that are created when we are roasting coffee. It is incredible. Underneath all of these, we could list a whole bunch more, okay? So now if I'm, if I'm roasting my curve and I see that my curve is going kind of flat or my curve is going kind of steep or my curve is perfect and it looks like the Mona Lisa of all curves, guess what? It doesn't really matter, it doesn't matter. I could stare at this curve all day long and it's not really telling me anything about the taste because at different kinds of heating, um, at different strengths, different powers of energy that we're pumping into that coffee, we can use that energy to cleave these base molecules, these large molecules, into a whole range of potential aromatic compounds. So if my curve is flat on one coffee, it may make a certain type of ketone. If my curve is sharp on another coffee, that may be what's necessary for that particular molecule to make the same kind of ketone, for instance. It is so vast and so um, in-depth molecularly and chemically that with our simple tools, there's no way to measure it. Actually, with very advanced scientific tools, there's no way to measure exactly how our molecules are going to break down. That's why bringing this back to a very simple um, answer to all of this, you have to taste the coffee. If you're looking at your curve and you are just driving hypothetical ideas of whether or not you roasted the coffee correctly based on how a curve looks, you have no idea what is actually in the coffee, okay?